Welcome today to the Orca Month Book Club. My name is Whitney Negabauer, and my co-host today is Colleen Weiler. Colleen, say hello. Hello, everybody. So as many of you know, June is Orca Action Month in the Pacific Northwest, and myself and Colleen are hosting the Orca Month Book Club, which allows um, the public to join us in um, some reading. This year we are reading Secrets of the Whales, which is a National Geographic um, article, and uh, we are also reading Spirits of the Coast. Today we will be talking about the National Geographic article Secrets of the Whales with Dr. John Ford. Welcome. Hi, Whitney. Hi, Colleen. Well, it's so wonderful to have you. Um, You were recently featured in this magazine article by Craig Welch, Secrets of the Whales. Um, And it sort of talks about the northern resident killer whales and southern resident killer whales and some of the differences. Um, Your work began with killer whales at the Vancouver Aquarium. And you've been studying wild killer whales since the 1970s, recently retired from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans in British Columbia. Um, A lot of your research has, of course, focused on behavioral ecology, social dynamics, and acoustic behavior of cetaceans. How did you first become involved with killer whale research? And could you share your first experience seeing an orca? Well, I, I, um, it, it goes back many decades, actually. Um, my first memory of seeing orcas was actually uh, when I was probably 10, 12 years old, and uh, my family and I would go out um, fishing for salmon out of Souk, which is just west of Victoria, southern Vancouver Island. And I have a, quite a distinct memory of, of uh a group of orcas swimming past and and uh, close to the boat. And of course, back in those days, this would have been in the early 60s, uh, everybody was terrified that these were dangerous animals and they would upset us and consume us right away. And so, you know, gripping the, the gunnel of the boat uh, so that, uh, you know, to hold on in case we got bumped, it was um, a memory that stayed with me for a long time. And then my next exposure was actually with... Um, the whale Moby Doll, which was captured in 1964. Uh, the intention of the Vancouver Aquarium at the time was to collect a, uh, a, a dead specimen from which to make a, a, a very accurate life-size model. So back in those days, people didn't think anything of, uh, of taking a killer whale, killing one for that purpose. And so this whale was, was harpooned off Saturna Island, just north of Orcas Island, and uh, it didn't die. It, it, it stayed alive despite this rather serious wound and lived for several months in in a sort of a temporary pen in Vancouver. Uh, and on one day, not long after the whale was moved to Vancouver, uh, the public was allowed to come down and, and view it in, in, in a dry dock, actually a flooded dry dock in North Vancouver. And my dad took me down there. And I remember seeing this little whale in there thinking, well, you know, that's not so scary after all. Um, and then uh, after that, I, I was intrigued with this species. I started uh, a job at the Vancouver Aquarium Uh when I was uh, still a student at UBC, undergrad student, and uh, spent the summers working with the whales there and learned a lot about them in the captive setting. But I, it just sort of instilled a, a real fascination and a desire to learn about them in the wild. And so shortly thereafter, I managed to get a study going on the underwater acoustics of the whales, uh, working closely with Michael Big and his colleagues in the mid, mid to late 70s. And that um, seven years later, I ended up with a PhD um, having documented the dialects that exist in the resident population, uh, these family-specific dialects that that really uh, we now recognize as being one of a suite of, of cultural traits in these animals. So that's kind of how, how things came to be in the early part of my, my career. So it sounds like your impression changed from killer whales or orcas being kind of scary creatures to not so much. So what were some of your initial impressions when you first started studying them instead of, you know, this childhood 
um, views of them? Well, when I started my graduate work in 1977, actually, it was right after um, some of the early results of Mike Big and Graham Ellis and Ian McCaskey, the three uh, colleagues who who um, started the photo identification program in the early 70s, and their early results were just coming out, and they were uh, finding that these groups were actually um, very cohesive, stable uh, social units. Uh, didn't really it wasn't really clear what they were, uh, but the fact that one could identify them and go out and repeatedly find them in, in the wild. It seemed to me the perfect situation where one could go out and with a hydrophone and record their sounds and document their behaviors and then try to link the two together. And so my early impressions of working with them in the wild was that, you know, these, these pods are really amazing things. They're, they're, um, they're, well, we at the time we didn't really understand. We recognized that they were kin groups of some kind, but the early thinking was that the big males with the tall dorsal fins in the group were actually the fathers of the offspring in the group. That that uh, and that was be more typical of of most social mammals, where the the group, the cohesive group, is a breeding group, and one would expect that um, when offspring reach maturity is probably um, most likely males typically uh, they would disperse and go and join in other groups and become the um, dominant males in those groups and and the father of animals in those groups and of course over the years the understanding kind of evolved um, such that we finally recognized that that was wrong. That was completely wrong that those big males in the group were not the fathers of the offspring in the group. They were the grown up sons of the old females in the group. And uh, it was a it was a recognition that came, I guess, kind of slowly. It wasn't a sudden eureka moment. It was suddenly it, it was an evolving recognition that this social structure was different and it raised all sorts of questions, but we were a little reluctant to recognize that it was the case because there was really not a precedent for this kind of thing in social mammals. It's, uh, it was just kind of unheard of that an individual born into a social group stays in that group for life. And that is, in fact, the situation that we now realize is the case. And, and as I was working with these pods in those early days, first the northern residents spent a couple of months working with them, recording their sounds and becoming quite familiar with them. And then late in that first summer, coming down to the Georgia Strait area um, and encountering J's and K's and L's, the southern residents, and uh, instantly it was clear that these animals sounded completely different. Uh, and I said, well, this, this, how could this be? You know, there's not meant to be dialects, essentially, at the, at the level that we were seeing them, uh, that I was hearing them initially between the northern and southern residents. But then as the study evolved and was able to record different groups separated from each other, that every pod had a distinct dialect and it was very complex and the, there were sets of pods that had very similar dialects and I called these clans and that the northerns had three clans and the southerns were one clan. So this was another thing that was without precedent uh, among mammals. So that was uh, again another piece of the puzzle that as we came to recognize that these were essentially cultures. These uh, cultures involved the dialects, involved uh, the kind of societies they live in, where they're these long-term matrilineal kinship groups that uh, were unique among social mammals. And then over time, we started to understand what they were feeding on and, and the recognition that their diet is determined by culture, that these are, these are behavior traditions that are passed on by social learning within the group. So that's um, another part of the whole puzzle that uh, makes these animals so special. Would you mind backing up just a little bit and defining exactly what is culture and, and how is it seen in animals, um, in cetaceans and, and in other species? Well, culture can be kind of a contentious term. And when we first started using the term, there were certainly some people in the scientific community that 
that were skeptical that that's really what it was. And and also within the sort of sociology, anthropology world, uh, people took uh, exception to use, us using that term to document or to describe behavior traditions in in um, in marine mammals, in in whales, uh, and it there's many different definitions of cultures, and and certainly some are very restrictive to the human model, and and that's not what we're trying to say. Basically, the the broader definition of culture that um, that those of us who who study them in whales, especially, basically say that okay, it's it's information or behavior patterns that are determined by social learning within a community and and also across generations that these behavior traditions are passed on from uh, one generation to the next. And so <clears throat> it doesn't necessarily mean it's a material culture because these whales don't have that kind of thing, but it's a, it's a, be, a suite of behavioral traditions that are acquired by learning. So that's that's basically what we mean by culture. So as you're studying the orcas and seeing those different signs of culture that you mentioned, the different dialects and different diets, what came first? Did you observe that and kind of realize that they had culture or were you learning about culture and animals from elsewhere and realizing that it applied to what you were observing with the whales? Well, when I was um, initially looking into the literature on acoustics of different vertebrate species as a grad student, trying to understand why these different pods had different sounds and what it meant, um, uh, I looked at the birdsong literature, and there's a lot of parallels between dialects in songbirds and dialects in in orcas. Um, they're, they're very different things, but there's some similar patterns in that they are they are learned by the individual, <clears throat> and so the the bird folks were were in their publications talking about cultural transmission of songs across generations, and so I thought, well, this is basically what we're seeing here. There was no uh, reasonable way that these would have been genetically determined dialects because they're so diverse within the community and also we now recognize that uh, that the the uh, dialects can be can be um, learned and uh, whales can mimic other dialects but the key thing that what uh, that made us realize uh, that um, cultures were involved in many things but especially the dialects was that um, Vocal learning is is very rare in mammals. Um, basically, humans, of course, we have vocal learning and some other primates, but basically, uh, mammals can't learn to reproduce sounds that they hear in their environment. It's just very, very rare. Uh, some of the whales do it, we now know. Uh, for example, humpbacks, um, they are constantly changing their song uh, from season to season or even within seasons uh, by listening to others in their surroundings and mimicking certain aspects of the song and the songs evolve. Uh, but very, very few mammals do that. For example, um, dogs, you know, you can't teach a dog to meow like a cat or vice versa. You know, they're hardwired vocal signals that uh, can't be modified. And so it was recognizing that vocal learning was involved and kind of opened the door to all sorts of uh, uh, advanced communication abilities. I'm not speaking of languages such as we have, but certainly it opened the door to things like family-specific dialects, which, which we now recognize are really important to these animals because they help maintain the cohesion, the identity, the integrity of the, of the matriline which can have four or even five generations of maternally related whales uh, alive at once because they're very long-lived animals. Um, and that these these 
different pods with their different dialects mix, travel together routinely, especially in the northern residents where you have these different clans. The clans have no calls in, share, uh, in common at all. They don't share across uh, these dialects. And even to the untrained ear, they sound very, very different. Uh, and, and yet these dialects enable them to keep themselves sorted out and uh, help to coordinate their behaviors. Now, another aspect of um, of their culture, of course, is is uh, is food sharing, and this is a very very strong tradition in the resident whales. That uh, if one whale catches a, a salmon, which is their another cultural trait, in that they're very much salmon specialists, especially the largest salmon, Chinook salmon. Um, they they bring that salmon to the surface and break it up and share it within close kin within the match line. And um, this is something that we didn't really recognize how predominant it was for many, many years and, and until we started looking really carefully, doing these focal animal follows where we would latch on uh, to a female, for example, with, with young whales, uh, who they're often the most productive hunters, and follow them at a de distance so as not to disturb the behavior but keep a very close eye on them. And we realized the mum would come up with a salmon and the offspring would, would swim in sometimes from hundreds of meters away and join her at the surface. And when we went to that spot where they joined, there were all these scales in the water. And of course, the scales we had been dipping out of the water to identify the, the species of, of prey. And uh, But we didn't really realize why we were getting these scales. But uh, over time, it became clear to us that, that uh, it's almost like... Um, I wouldn't call it a ritual necessarily, but uh, in the great majority of cases, the salmon are shared, which is really interesting because for a big animal, a big predator like that, um, they could easily consume the salmon. One whale could without even breaking it up. They could just swallow it, but they don't. And it's now we think re one of the reasons that these very cohesive stable groups can can exist without having competition within the groups you know if things get tough um animals would maybe compete with each other and and become aggressive to each other uh if there's not enough food to go around but that just doesn't happen they 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 share their prey so that if there is nutritional stress for whatever reason it's kind of shared among all the uh, individuals in the group again another part of their culture so you mentioned a few examples of culture. What were some of the other examples that you witnessed, and what was your initial reactions to to, to understanding what they really were? Well, one of the um, one of the very strong cultural traditions in the northern resident whales up in um, northeast Vancouver Island and, and elsewhere in their range, in the northern range right up into southeast Alaska, uh, a very strong tradition is beach rubbing, and they. The end of the whales have uh, traditional beaches that they go to, at least in the northern northeast Vancouver Island area, of John, uh, the Robson Bight area, um, which is an ecological reserve set aside for the whales. Uh, they go to these little beaches of pebbles in an otherwise rocky shoreline, and they rub their bodies on it for sometimes well over an hour at a time. The whole group will uh, go back and forth rubbing on these smooth pebbles, and it was... Uh, something that we didn't really understand, and perhaps we don't yet understand fully what, why they do this, because it is uh, something that they'll do on a daily basis or sometimes multiple times during a 24-hour period in that area. Um, and they have actual rubbing locations we now know in more remote parts of the coast where we've gone to work with the whales up on the central British Columbia coast, the northern coast, and so on. The interesting thing is um, the southern residents don't have this tradition. They don't seem to rub anywhere. And they have some other traditions that are a little more subtle. Uh, for example, these greeting ceremonies that happen when J's or K's and L's have been apart for some time. When they meet up again, they go through a process of lining up at the surface and sort of like facing off. And then uh, they'll all dive together and there's a great commotion, lots of underwater calling and so on. And a lot of excitement. Uh, this this doesn't really happen to the same degree in the northern residents, it seems. It's just not part of their thing. Um, another difference is southern residents are way more acrobatic. They just seem to breach more. Uh, the northern residents do breach, but 
not nearly as much as the southern. So these are just some of the cultural dif- differences between these um, these two populations. But otherwise, they're essentially the same whales. You know, they basically they're ecologically the same. They forage for primarily Chinook salmon. They will eat other species of salmon, but it seems that Chinook is is uh, by far the preferred predominant prey for these whales. And they often seem reluctant to eat anything else. Um, and that's the same between northern and southern residents. And so one of the curious things um, about um, these cultural differences is why those two populations don't mix. We now know that off southwestern Vancouver Island, uh, it's an important feeding area for southern residents. We knew that, but when we put out long-term acoustic recorders to to uh, to document who was there by by their dialects, it's a difficult place to study. It's often rough or foggy and windy, and and you know it's quite a few miles offshore. These banks, Swiftsure Banks, uh, La Prusse Bank. We realized that uh, or discovered that the northern residents are out there an awful lot, just, almost just as much in the same area. So we we um, but you'd never hear them together, and we've never seen northern and southerns traveling together. They're kind of xenophobic uh, with other residents, which is which is a peculiarity, and that's I guess one of the things about these these cultural traits, sometimes idiosyncrasies, that they. Um, they're hard to explain. I mean, it would make a lot of sense for Southern residents to mix with Northern residents, to mate with them, because the Southerns, we now realize, are are, are somewhat inbred because the population is so small, yet they don't mix outside their little community of 74, or whatever it is right now, whales. So is to their detriment. And I guess that's another aspect of this whole cultural uh, phenomenon in that in many respects, it's a, it's a good thing. Um, cultural specialists uh, can be uh, more successful than generalists in that a specialist predator can outcompete a generalist predator because they get really good at what they do. Uh, there's an old adage, uh, jack of all trades, master of none. So uh, if you're really good at all sorts of different things, you're not... Re- or if you're good at all sorts of different things, you're not really good at any particular thing. And and uh, ecological specialists like like resident killer whales become really good at Chinook predation, which can work really well uh, as long as the food supply is maintained. But if that food supply suddenly changes, drops for whatever reason, whether it's natural ecological diff- changes or or anthropogenic changes through overfishing, these kind of things. They don't necessarily have the ability to change the culture very quickly. Uh, and so they keep looking for that specific prey that they've grown up to be focused on in everything they do, where they, where they go, at what time of the year, and so on. Um, and if they can't get enough, they, it seems, become nutritionally stressed, and that opens the door to the effects of PCBs, for example, which these animals sequester in their blubber. They metabolize their blubber because they they need the energy from the blubber, and that frees up the PCBs, and that can have an effect on their immune system, their ability to survive infections, parasitism, and so on. So so that is kind of a downside of, of uh, these cultural specialisms, if you like. Um, a, a, another trait that, um, or another factor, I guess, in that whole um, question about specialism versus generalism is um, uh, Hal Whitehead, a, a, a colleague and good friend who is the basically the pioneer of, of studying culture and, and promoting recognition of culture and cetaceans, especially his work on sperm whales. Um, he's written the book on the cultural lives of whales and dolphins. He and I did a bit of a modeling exercise looking at the fate of um, populations of killer whales, hypothetically in mo- in a modeling context, uh, generalist versus specialist. And it, it seems that indeed specialists can do really well for a certain period of time, but they tend to live in smaller populations and, and therefore... They don't have as great genetic diversity. And they also have a higher rate of extinction as a result because of 
various factors can make them more vulnerable to, uh, you know, small populations' reliance on a particular kind of food. They're, they're more vulnerable to ecological changes, and and over over time, they they at least the model suggests that they kind of wink out more regularly than a generalist form. So sometimes those cultural traits like food specialization can be a little bit counterproductive to survival for these distinct populations. It does, it does seem that way. Um, uh, as we were, as we were um, learning through our prey fragment sampling that's looking for scales and bits of tissue in the water after a kill. And it became uh, clear that Chinook salmon were by far the most predominant prey of these whales. And that to us didn't make any sense because we were often sampling in the middle of the summer when there's big runs of pink salmon and sockeye. You could see the schools of salmon all around the whales and they'd make a kill and we'd get the scales and fully expect them to be sockeye but when we got the results back from the scale gurus who can id the species and age from the scales they were predominantly chinook and we thought well how, how can this be and it, i guess it does make sense for those reasons i just mentioned about specialists can really make a good living focusing on a particular kind of prey but chinook are so much more rare than these other species. I think you have to go back in time to look at historical abundance of Chinook on this coast. And they were, there were huge runs of Chinook salmon and they were big fish. Uh, the Columbia River, the Fraser River had runs of millions of, of Chinook and easily enough to support a rather large population of, of specialist Chinook predators. And that seems to be how they evolved. Um, and so it it made sense, but one one wonders though, for a large brained intelligent uh, mammal, why they wouldn't when Chinook abundance suddenly drops, why wouldn't they just switch to other species? And they probably do. We now know that they do eat other species in the winter, especially when there's fewer Chinook around. but um, over the whole year, Chinook still is is the most important. Um, so why don't they become generalists? For example, if Chinook are becoming scarce, it clearly would one would think would would be part of the solution for the predicament they're in right now, especially the southern residents. Um, but these behavior traditions are I think, really ingrained in the in the individuals and and it's just difficult for them to change it's like a bit of a a rut they're in um i think you know whales probably born to a group uh and has a clean slate it doesn't know what food is it, there's no genetic unlikely to be any genetic predisposition to want to eat fish versus a seal like the big killer whales do they, that's their specialism um so they learn what food is by uh, being provisioned by their mom and their siblings and, and the relatives in the matriline. And uh, they learn how to catch that food as they, as they get older. And they become very reluctant to change. That's their thing and this is what they do. And I think a really good example of just how ingrained these traditions are is uh, uh, an incident that took place back in 1970, so what, 50 years ago, uh, where a small group of, uh, of killer whales was captured and kept in a bay near Victoria. And this was during the era of live captures for aquaria and whales were being sent from this area to aquariums in different parts of the world and there was a bunch of money to be gained by those who captured them. So this group of um, what we now recognize to be uh, big killer whales or transients were captured and maintained in, a, in the bay and they refused all food that was offered to them. And that was, you know, salmon, lingcod, and so on. Because back in the course in those days, this is before the photo identification study, this is before any idea, there was any idea that there was these um, dietary specializations within different populations of killer whales in the same waters. Um, and they refused all food offered to them for um, 79 days, if you can believe it. So, you know, well over two months, they didn't eat at all. Uh, because they they were mammal hunters and they didn't recognize 
fish as basically being food. Eventually, one whale died of malnutrition, um, and then not long thereafter, they started eating fish. And um, probably reluctantly, sort of holding their nose, but... um, it wasn't that much later that um, they were actually released from the bay by by persons unknown who went out there and weighed down the nets at night, and the whales got out. Um, and there's, there's, of course, this is the T2 matriline that is still out there today, and they they went right back to a mammal hunting lifestyle and probably just a bad memory of, of eating that stuff that they had to. So a- anyway, I think it's a great example of how how resistant to change these animals can be. So you've mentioned several of the ways that culture can, in some instances, be counterproductive. Are there ways that culture can influence conservation and be helpful? Well, I think I think conservation of these whales really needs to take into account the cultural features that that uh, these whales depend on and and this is something that Hal Whitehead and I have been involved with recently in some workshops about this um, with folks who study um, culture in all sorts of different uh, animals and basically building a case that in conservation efforts one has to recognize that cultures are important and and uh, are indeed necessary for these animals' um, survival, for their recovery if their numbers are depleted. And and um, so it is really important to conservation. Uh, I think a, a great example is, you know, the different ecological specialists of, of orcas on our coast, where we have, um, of course, the residents, the, the Chinook feeding whales, we have the big killer whales, the seal, sea lion, porpoise feeding whales primarily. And then these offshore killer whales, which um, we now recognize as being shark specialists that prey on a variety of different species of sharks, sleeper sharks, these big deep water sharks, blue sharks, dogfish, um, salmon sharks. They specialize on these sharks to the point that the their their teeth are worn flat to their gums even when they reach their mid-teens as sub-adults because the abrasiveness of the skin we think is such on sharks that that it sands their teeth down residents and the big killer whales have perfectly fine teeth even as old animals so um these these are obviously really important to think about if you're trying to promote the recovery or the conservation of these different populations. You have to worry about the different diets they have. And if you think historically how we have affected these whales, um, for example, the big killer whales, the, the transients, the mammal hunters, they they uh, no doubt were abundant our, on our coast historically. And then when Europeans arrived, um, the um, sort of the the view of other marine mammals was not a great one to the point that uh, harbor seals and sea lions were were slaughtered on our coast. They were culled as as uh, for predator control basically because it was felt that they ate too many fish, salmon that were rightfully humans humans and. Um, and they were depleted down to less than 10% of historical abundance. And this is why we think in the early uh, 70s, in the mid 70s, when we started studying uh, the whales on this coast, the big killer whales were really rare. It was just a, 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 a great surprise to find these little groups occasionally. You know, we found the, the residents regularly, uh, but the uh, the big killer whales, um, not so much. And of course, over that was right around the time that the culling and the bounty programs that reduced seals and sea lions ended and the population started rebounding. And now they're back up close to historical abundance levels. And um, and as a result, the big killer whales have rebounded really well. They're doing just great. And today in the Sailor Sea, they're far more commonly seen than are the residents, which of course are, are now suffering because of what has happened to their main food 
And it may be also the case with the offshore killer whales, the, the shark predators. There was huge fisheries for uh, for dogfish and other sharks back in the 1940s for um, uh, for cod liver oil, basically, as a vitamin supplement before the vitamin was um, was synthesized. And abundance was probably reduced severely. Another example of probably what was a really important prey of offshore killer whales was basking sharks, you know, big filter feeding shark that's 10 meters long, you know, and, and uh, easy prey for a shark specialist predator. There's no teeth in their mouth. You know, they just are sitting ducks. And, of course, the offshore killer whales love liver of sharks because it's really full of lipids. It's very energy dense. And um, this is probably what they eat um, predominantly. And basking sharks are just like a big swimming liver. Yet in the 50s, we set about to remove basking sharks to eliminate them from this coast because they were considered a nuisance, a pest, not because they were dangerous, but because they they blundered into, you know, swimming around at the surface as a filter feeder with their mouth open. They blundered into salmon gill nets, which were, you know, all over the coast because of the a lot of fisheries going on. And it would they'd wrap themselves up in the nets and the fishermen would complain to the fisheries department that their livelihood's being ruined because their nets are are being damaged and destroyed and costing them a fortune. So the fisheries department should do something about them. So they did. They set uh, set about to kill the basking sharks and did a really good job. They're critically endangered on our coast right now. There's maybe one or two sightings um, in the coastal British Columbia a year now. And did we did we remove uh, uh, an important food source for offshore killer whales? Maybe this is why there's only we think about 500 or so of this ecotype um, on the whole coast between California and and the Aleutians, which is their range. They go up and down the coast on the outer continental shelf looking for sharks. So anyway, just an example of the of how we've affected these different ecological specialists over time and if we want to promote their recovery how we have to take into consideration their cultures especially their dietary cultures wow i didn't know that there was a an effort to get rid of sharks off the coast too that's that's really interesting um so culture is important for conservation it's important for science too and you mentioned uh previously that it had been a little bit controversial to apply it to mammals and to cetaceans and killer whales especially. Uh, do you think it's still controversial? Is it still an area of debate or is it pretty well accepted in conservation and in scientific circles now? Uh, I I think it's gaining a lot more acceptance in recent years and, and uh, we don't really hear much criticism of, of it. And now that it's recognized that we're not trying to say that uh, by having cultures that whales and dolphins are swimming around, you know, there are humans swimming around in fish suits, you know, uh, they're not, we're not trying to say that, you know, they have dialects, that means they have a language like ours. You know, there, there is, um, there has, I think, over time, in, in the past, especially been this uh, belief that um, people who study whales and dolphins are often anthropocentric or anthropomorphic, you know, that they, they attribute human uh, traits to these animals. Um, and I think now that it, it's more broadly recognized by what we mean by culture, isn't that they're like humans, but that so, sort of advanced social vertebrates, mammals and birds and other species, um, have pre behavior traditions that are important to their survival, that they're not all uh, genetically hardwired to make a living in the particular way they do, um, that that these cultures um, are, are super important. And I, I think because of the, the sort of broader reviews that... Um, Many of us who've been involved in these um, these workshops in the last few years have published showing that animal cultures matter for conservation. It's not just the whales and dolphins; it's other species too. So I, I think I think it's a, a widespread re, uh, recognition and acceptance now that that these things are really um, true. That they, these um, these behavior traditions maintained by social learning. Um, 
and that they they are important. You've mentioned some of the ways that the uh, northern resident killer whales and southern resident killer whales are different, and you know some have been have been pointing to the northern residents doing relatively well and having success um, could be causing the southern residents to further decline. What is your opinion on that? I think it's very possible that this is a problem. Um, And again, it was only fairly recently that we recognized through our um, autonomous recorders out on the outer coast that that there's far more um, uh, overlap of northerns and southerns um, than we ever expected. Um, so, uh, it, you know, when, when, it, when we de- determined what runs of uh, Chinook salmon were important to both these populations, it was, it was clear that the northern residents, I think, have the first crack at many of these populations that are heading for spawning rivers like the Fraser and the Columbia, the big rivers. They come down the coast from the Gulf of Alaska uh, to head these rivers. So the the northern residents have sort of the first crack at them geographically. And so we realized that was the case. Um, And as the northern population has been growing, uh, that means that there might be less, you know, down the bi- pipe for the southern residents by the time the, the Chinook arrive off southern Vancouver Island, Juan de Fuca Strait, and, and so on. Um, that on top of the fact that they're competing with each other on this shared range on the outer coast uh, makes it even more clear that this could be an issue for the southern residents. Uh, the, south- the northerns have gained... Since the late 90s, when both populations suffered decline simultaneously, that was correlated with a coastwide drop in abundance of Chinook salmon. Since that ended in the early 2000s, the northern residents have gained more than 100 individuals in the population. They're now 320 or so, uh, whereas the southerns have, well, since the, around that time, they've sort of held their own, but generally a downward trajectory. So there's a lot more northerns uh, with mouths being fed um, with prey that otherwise might have made it to the southern range. So, yeah, I think I think um, I think the northern residents could be part of the problem for the southern residents. So you're you're learning about some of that stuff through your hydrophones and listening devices out on Swiftshire and the Outer Coast, and you're semi-retired from DFO, um, and your schedule was whale-dependent for sitting down and chatting with you. So what are you working on currently? Well, um, I've been doing a lot of um, of uh, orca translation, if you like. Um, f- I still recognize the dialects pretty well from uh, from my graduate school days. You know, describing all these these uh, these different calls. Um, there's you know well over, uh, I guess, between the northerns and southerns and the big killer whales. There's there's well over a hundred different call stereotype calls and and subtypes of calls, and I remember them all basically. My hearing's not quite what it was when I was a grad student, so I don't get all those high frequencies anymore. But I still know the dialect. So, uh, because of the these networks of hydrophones that are out there now, and um, the use of autonomous recorders that can record in, in different areas for uh, a year at a time, uh, it's really beneficial to be able to say which group it is in in the recordings. Now, um, people are, are working hard on developing computer recognition algorithms to automatically distinguish um, different, well, they're starting to try and distinguish orcas from other species like humpbacks and so far these algorithms really aren't very good they're nowhere near as good as the human ear and in terms of distinguishing the different dialects of the different uh, populations northern southern big killer whales and within uh, those populations different clans and and pods and things like that um, 
it really is the human ear that that is still needed to do it. So I'm finding myself of some use going back, spending a lot of time sort of saying, okay, this is who is, we think, you know, inferring who's present in those recordings from from their dialects, which has been a lot of fun. And interestingly enough, uh, you know, I've now been studying the dialect since the late 70s. So I don't know, don't really want to calculate how many years that is, but it's over 40. Um, and what's really interesting to me is, just how similar they sound today as they did when I was, you know, in my 20s, um, describing the dialects. There really has been very little change in these calls uh, over, you know, over decades. And in fact, I have some old recordings I dug up when I was a grad student from um, the Canadian Navy and actually the U.S. Navy that um, were clearly of southern residents j-pod in particular and these recordings from 1958 and 1960 long time ago they're making the same calls they do today um which raises an interesting question about how ancient these dialects might be if they're passed on from generation to generation uh, they might persist for a long time now a biological generation for uh, orcas is around 20 three or four years. But one has to think in terms of cultural generations where if a young whale, a young female born into a group learns the dialect of of her mum, and she might learn it in utero, in utero because the sounds of her mum are going to be ringing in her ears as she's developing before birth because there's nothing to stop the sound from going into unlike humans you know the sound goes trans is transmitted very readily from from ocean into tissue anyway they learn the dialects and keep that dialect for her life which could be 80 90 years for for old whales old female matriarchs and they probably are really resistant to change so uh, the, these dialects might persist for many cultural generations which means that they could be around for a century more who knows but uh it's another intriguing part of the cultural story for these whales that's really fascinating and i just love to hear that um that the human brain is still better than computers so that's fabulous <laughs> not out of a job yet so. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Um, For all the listeners and viewers out there, if you would like to join Colleen and I on and others in a community discussion online, you can go to orcamonth.com to learn more about the community discussion about about this reading, the National Geographic magazine article, Secrets of the Whales. We're going to be discussing it June 17th. And um, so I hope to to see you all online. You can also see all sorts of other events that are going on for Orca Action Month at orcamonth.com. For more information about Whale Scout, visit whalescout.org and for more information about whale and dolphin conservation go to whales.org thank you so much